better. <laughs> because it doesn't actually matter what anyone else says, that's all I hear for the next half hour. With a bit of feedback, guys? It's all right, I'll just keep talking. Um, right, that's great. <laughs> I'm actually surprised to see so many people here, you know, uh, getting up early in the morning. Uh, I appreciate that most of the people are here to see the crazy man in the kilt. I was laughed at this morning for wearing sandals with it, which is embarrassing, but um, I wasn't going to wear my, my traditional boot here in Spain. I couldn't believe it. So that's, that's great. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Kevin John Gallagher. Uh, I've not spoken at Jane Beyond for a couple of years, so it's great to be back. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for putting me in the seven or, or the uh, early morning Sunday slot. That's great. Um, <laughs> Is it normally the reason for that, and I was told last time was because the last time I did Jane Beyond, I went out on the Saturday night and trundled in just in time to give my talk. Uh, so this time they wanted to make sure that I was nice and early and couldn't go out, and that's great. So thank you to that. I believe that some of you are up at seven this morning for a run, which is just mental. Just mental. All three. All three, exactly. What are you doing with your life? Absolutely. Uh, well, some of you were trundling home at 7 a.m. from Cafe Baghdad. <laughs> For everyone who didn't laugh at that, you want to Google that at the end and then remember that Robert Jacobi is the only one who knew what it was. <laughs> and brilliantly, because his wife is at home watching this, this is streaming through YouTube. So that'll be an interesting conversation. <laughs> Robert will not be at next year's Jane and Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is called uh, All Good Things. Uh, it's a little talk I put together about uh, change, a little bit of change management, what drives change, and why it's not such a scary beast, and more importantly, how we are going to change the world. So it's not at all heavy, it's very light, where we don't really get into it that much. The phrase comes from Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote this uh, in like the 1300s, crazy long time ago, and yet we still talk about it in English. It is, all good things must come to an end. And because it's Sunday morning and because it's a nice relaxing day, I wanted to thank each and every one of you that got up, uh, the ones that weren't on the run, obviously you're mental still. Uh, I wanted to change the, my Paul Bettany slide. So here is a slightly better Paul Bettany playing Geoffrey Chaucer slide. All good things must come to an end with Paul Bettany's arse on display. <laughs> Everyone wants better but no one wants change. This is one of my favorite quotes I found last year by a guy called Jonathan Friedman. And it's the sort of phrase that people initially go, well, no, no, we, we do want change. Certainly in tech, we're like, we can handle change. And, and most people accept that they want to be better and they're willing to do the work that goes with it. My first question to that is usually, have you ever seen a thin person drink Diet Coke? That's good. <laughs> Who here wants better schools for children? That's, that's actually a very small number of hands. That's, I really hope you're all asleep. Okay, that's grand. I'm going to pretend that everyone raised their hands. All right, so everyone wants better education. Who wants better health care and would rather it be free? Excellent. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Who wants to have their taxes raised by 20%? Oh, a few people. Excellent. That's great. Yeah, I'm the same. Right. Genuinely, no one raises their hand at that. Next time, I'm going to say 50% just to try and keep it down. For the most part, we all want that better. We all want things to change for us. But the actual act of changing it is usually really, really hard. It's something that's ingrained to us. So as a tech question, who, want, who likes PHP 7? Good, that's all right. Who likes microservices? Who likes to have light touch decoupled frameworks? Who likes things to work super fast and in a modern way? Excellent. Who here uses a product that, that prides itself on backward compatibility? Some of you are lying. <laughs> a lot of you are lying. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. We get that. On one hand, we're, we're excited about the new changes coming in tech, specifically around Joomla 4 or Joomla X or whatever it's called now. But by the same token, we appreciate that Joomla is a mass market product and it's got to support its existing clients and its existing client base. This dichotomy is always going to drive us. It's always going to be tough. 
And there's a great example of that that we can all agree on. I loved IE6. I absolutely loved IE6. I genuinely did. My mum loved it. And my love, mum loved it for very different reasons. My mum loved IE6 because the buttons were huge. The move to Chrome was a disaster for her because my mum, who's short-sighted, went from these huge, monolithic, god-awful buttons that she could actually use to a lovely, streamlined thing. We were trying Firefox themes, we were trying to get it right, but at the end of the day, my mum didn't care that we got text shadows as we moved away from IE, that it was easier for us to program. The thing that got my mum to move away from Internet Explorer, and I'm confident it's going to be the thing that, that helped you move people away from Internet Explorer, was the thing that gets humans to move all the time. It's the only constant driver in change, and that is fear. The thing that got my mum to change away from Internet Explorer was that the bad guys were going to get her. It is so insecure that zombies, Osama bin Laden, and probably Apple are tracking everything you do, and they're going to steal your credit card data, mum, and I don't care if you like the big buttons, um, I want to keep the house and for you not to get scammed. And that's what got her changed over. For the most part, and it's a really, really primal thing, what drives us is fear. And the fear that drives us is pain. Our brain can't distinguish the difference. So when it thinks of something that is scary, it associates it with pain. There's going to be a couple of Tony Robbins quotes because he's, he's my hero and I love quoting him. Um, but this is, this is a great one to describe it. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. If you're driving change in anything, in your organization, in your code, or in your life, you have to remember that this is what drives us. Then another Tony Robbins quote, which I really love, and I'm probably going to misquote because I can't read it out, is that our brains are not built for happiness. Our brains are built for survival. The reality is that trying to please everyone, trying to make change happen in a happy way is actually incredibly, incredibly hard. Because for the most part, our brains are like lizard brains, and we're driven for survival. And what triggers our survival is fight and flight, which is fear and pain. I'm not French, in case you hadn't realized by the kilt, or the bad accent. So my pronunciation of this will be terrible. That's not at all concerning. <laughs> I'm going to move over here for this. Uh, plus sa chance, plus c'est la même chose, which roughly translated by Google is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. A phrase that gets repeated at me often in my job. Here's the thing about this. It was written in the 17th century by a guy called John Baptiste Carr. He actually has about 17 names, but this is the, the short version. And in the 17th century, that was true. Nothing really had changed fundamentally for humans in about 100,000 years. We got up when the sun came up, we went to bed when the sun went down, we drank alcohol, we ate too much, and we ran away from things we didn't like. And for all the advances that we had in almost 100,000 years, from the fact that we'd moved into houses, for the fact that we'd started farming some 50,000 years ago, for the fact that we all worked for a boss we didn't like, that one's still the same. Virtually nothing had changed to the way humans think or work. And that was true in the 17th and 18th century. Here's the thing about today, and I say this lovingly, it was a lie today. It isn't true. Electricity changed that. And it's a really fundamental thing. We now can work whenever we want. We can travel in cars and planes and boats. We can see the world. So many of us have traveled here today. The concept that the more things change, the more they stay the same, is simply not true. It is driven by people who are in fear of change. And fear of change is back to that primal concept, that lizard brain that says, I don't want things to change because I'm scared of them. That, that comes from 100,000 years of DNA 
ladies and gentlemen. That comes from the fact of, as a, a, a <laughs> Neanderthal man, I say that, and I'm looking down as the man with the skill and the sandals. Uh, I say that as a Neanderthal man constantly wandered the earth and said, that looks really wonderful over there. That looks much better. I'm going to go and look, oh shit, a snake, and run away. We have been built to fear change, which is why for hundred thousands of years, the more things changed, the more they say was true. But that is not true now. One of my other favorite Chinese proverbs that for years I acquitted to Confucius, but apparently it's not him, is when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and some people build windmills, windmills even. We've seen it ourselves in tech. When IE was insecure and Firefox really wasn't cutting it in the same way Netscape 4 and 5 and 6 didn't cut it, Google built Chrome and open sourced it. When the Mambo project was flagging and not cutting it for a lot of you guys, you created the Joomla project. When B2 and Typekit, not Typekit, uh, when B2 and whatever the movable type one was, I've completely <laughs> forgotten it, it uh, wasn't cutting it, Matt and a guy called Mike Little in England created WordPress. The key thing of change is actually accepting the need for change. Something that is not taught to us very often. Let me give you this example. I call these guys Generation Kirks because baby boomers sounds like just too nice a phrase. Moreover, they're always fucking happy. And the reason they're happy, ladies and gentlemen, is because they're living on retirement and they're the last generation that's ever going to get retirement money. And they are smug, smug bastards about it. But let me give you a little information about the uh, baby boomers and what it has done to us to help understand change in this era. Our grandparents and the parents before them lived through terrible times. Lots of children, very little food. Our grandparents lived through two world wars. They lived through depression. They lived through prohibition. I don't know what your life is like, but my life without alcohol is fairly boring. I wake up <laughs> a lot. And the, the message departed by our grandparents to our parents was pick a job, stay at it, work hard, and good things will happen. More importantly, you'll be able to feed your kids, and one day the positive changes will come. And our parents and the generation around them, the baby boomers, they went to school, they, they worked hard, they got a job in the 70s, and they stuck at it. And what happened was, in the 80s, the global economy changed. Lots of money came around, Wall Street happened, Top Gun happened with three Star Wars movies that were great, and none of them involved Jar Jar. The 80s were a fantastic fucking time. And what we had was, we had a generation who had what their parents said compounded to them. That's right, I've worked hard, I've stuck in the same job, I've been slowly promoted, I have money, this is great, I'm going to tell my kids to do exactly the same. Here's the thing, that isn't true for us anymore. Jobs for life are not there. The banks are, are crumbling or merging. There's less of them. Almost all of us work for ourselves or work for a shop uh, with less than 20 people. The number of small businesses and micro businesses and self-employed people uh, in the EU has almost doubled in the last 10 years. The model told to us by the people who are taking our retirement money and are ruining the economy, that no longer works. Yet they're not ready to accept the change. And for most of us in work, we still follow the patterns that have been told to us because this is what worked in industry for the last 100 years. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a failing on us and I wanna help us change that. The first thing to do is to know the business you're in. This is a really cheesy thing, but hands up if someone who could tell me what industry they're in. Frank. Internet services. Internet services, okay, that's grand. I'm going to throw that around, uh, a slightly more deeper question. Hands up who can tell me the, what industry Joomla is in. Publishing, great. So that one is slightly closer, right? That's grand. So it's, it's interesting to me that so the first instance that virtually no one knew what industry Joomla was in, right? <laughs> because no one said anything. But for internet services and publishing, what we have to understand is that Joomla is a great example, is there to allow people to put information out there. 
It's not there to allow people to geek out. It's not there for you know, people to learn to code on. Joomla is there for publishing. And it's the same with WordPress. And it's the same with Drupal. And we've seen that change. Four years ago, Dries said in his keynote that uh, Drupal was going nowhere because it was confounded to people that loved tech. And actually, he said it needed to be aiming for enterprises and publishing. That's why Drupal doesn't care for the number of people that are on WordPress sites. It's great. It's a completely different thing. I worked with a football club not that long ago in Scotland who didn't quite grasp this. They thought they were in the football business. Their pies were terrible. The cost of the concessions were terrible. They didn't open the gates until half an hour before the football game, even though people were outside in the cold and the rain, because that's summer in Scotland. And very quickly, that football club died. It wasn't getting people through, because they didn't realize they were in the entertainment and leisure business. And their job was to keep people entertained. They didn't change with the times. They didn't realize that the person coming through the door was no longer the person working in the mill or the coal mine or the factory and then coming into the football on his way home. The consumer had changed. And by not recognizing what industry the football club was actually in, it lost. Now it's in a very lower division and it's not doing very well and it will technically go bust. Here is my key phrase, and I think it's the only time I quote myself, which is really arrogant, I'm sorry. It's not what you're changing, it's what you're solving. And if I can add to that a little bit, it's why you're solving it. The why is really important. The what is really simple, right? And it's, and it, it's, the, it's simple, not easy, but you need to get your head around what. But if you want people to come with you on the journey, if you want that change to happen, you have to understand the why. And the easiest and the first way to do that, in my instance, is to try and work out what industry you're actually in. Because for most people and most businesses that I go and consult to, it's the fundamental thing they have wrong. This isn't actually Albert Einstein, but it's a great quote anyway. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I say that politely right now because the internet is changing things, we all know that. But actually, the rate of change for the internet is speeding up. We've seen that PHP 6 didn't happen, right? But PHP 7 has. And it's not just the fact that, is it that, that bad? <laughs> we've seen change, we've seen the move to microservices, we've seen the move to software as a service. How we think about projects like Joomla, how they can change the world, because that's what we're trying to do in open source. We have to think about it fundamentally different. Joomla 4 should not be a new version of Joomla 3 or Joomla 1.5. The world has changed, the need has changed, the industry you're in has changed. And I say this politely because as open sourcers, we want to change the world, and I believe we're going to, and we are. We just need to make sure that we keep up with it and not just do the same thing we've always done and hope that it'll have different results. Last Tony Robbins quote, I promise. Change is inevitable, but progress is optional. Change happens all the time, but how much actually progresses? It leads back to the quote earlier from Jean Baptiste that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's true because the change happened, but the progress didn't. One of the things I really want to depart to you guys, because we're not going to see each other for a year. I want the next version of Joomla. I want the next version of your website. I want the next iteration of your business to be better. I want it to be more in line with the industry you're in. I want it to be more in line with the open source fundamentals. I want it to be more in line with where we are going, not just in tech, but in our lives. And I think you can, because I think you guys, by embracing change and embracing the fundamental why behind the change, I think you guys can help save the world. All good things must come to an end, and you'll be glad to know this is my final story. This is my Jersey Shore story. In the 90s, late 90s, I, I, I didn't look like this at all. But in the late 90s, I was a lifeguard in New Jersey for a summer. 
It was 98. It was great. It was hot. I sweated an awful lot. Myself and my brother were working for a Camp America thing in Maurice Pier in Wildwood, New Jersey. And uh, one day, uh, a rather large American gentleman brought in his son, who was even larger, uh, because he said, I want to change how my son views water. He's scared of it. He's scared to take his top off. He's scared of any exercise. I want to show him that it's okay. I want to change things for my son. And right enough, his son was learning to swim and really struggling. But his son really enjoyed the big flume, the chute. So he was going up and down constantly. Really great way of getting him used to landing in the water. And then something bad happened on the sixth or seventh go. This young American went into the water too fast and basically bombed and hit his head. And he was underneath the water. Now, the dad was freaking out as any parent would. He was going through his head, how much of it was his fault? How quickly can he get to his son? He can't go down the chute because he might land on him. He was just, the fear had taken over him. He knew he needed to do something, but he didn't know what it was. My brother, who much better swimmer than I was, dived in, lifted this poor child to safety, took him out and took all the credit. The next day, this gentleman, and we're going to call him Bob, just for easiness. This American gentleman drove two hours in the blazing heat, about 30, 33 degrees uh, in New Jersey, and he drove for two hours to give us a thank you present for saving his son. Here's the thing. The thing he brought us was a 12-pack of bird's eye frozen potato waffles <laughs> that had been melted, if not cooked, in the car for two hours. I tell this story quite a lot, and I used to tell it around the generosity of Americans, but also sometimes that maybe things pass their, over their head a little bit. The reason I do this is because of something. What he said to us was, boys, thank you very much for saving our son. I wanted to give you a gift, but this isn't a gift for you. This is a gift to send home. We're like, okay, why is that? He said, well, I know you guys are struggling with potatoes over there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this was 1998. The potato famine in Ireland had ended in 1846. <laughs> yet information had not yet reached New Jersey. <laughs> I've been laughing at that story for 15 years, unfairly at Bob until this year. On January the 8th of this year, I was speaking at a conference with my hero, Tony Robbins. There's no more quotes, there's just a great photo of me and him. Um, and Tony talks a lot about feeding people. That's, that's what drives him, because he grew up without food. And he uh, said that he was matching donations to an Irish charity. And I thought, well, that's okay, what sort of charity is it? It's a charity that talks about the number of children that don't have food. The number of children in Ireland last year that go to school or bed without food each day is one in four. It's like that all across the EU. It's one in seven in Britain. It's one in four in France. It's one in five in Germany. It's one in four right here in Spain. I haven't put Italy marked up on this because I kind of want to pull the quote out at UNICEF. This is a quote from the UNICEF report from 2013. This number has only gotten worse. One in two minors in Italy eat a maximum of one adequate meal every two days. If I was to put that slide back up, there's a good chance that the circle would be the whole way along the end. At least half the children in Italy, the third richest country in the economic area, go without food every second day. It's not just us. Where Bob was from in New Jersey, it was terrible. 60 million kids live without consistent access to food in the US today. Well, actually 2014. That's one out of five kids. 21 million children rely on free or reduced price school lunches for their nutritional needs. See, most people, when I tell the story about Bob, and myself included for the last 15 years, I thought of Bob as something like this, right? I thought, ah, oh, he's an idiot, and it's a fun story. But that's changed. See, 
I don't see Bob as that anymore. And that's why I've given him a name as Bob beforehand. He was just the father. I see Bob as my hero because Bob was trying to change something. Bob was trying to change and save the world, just in a different way from us. Bob looked at the fact that there was two Irish immigrants, as he saw them, working hard in New Jersey. He had the concept that we were sending money and food home. And he wanted to change that. He wanted to help. He could have just brought us beer as a thank you. He could have actually, if he wanted to be charitable, he could have given money at home or food to homeless people in New Jersey. But that isn't what he wanted. What Bob wanted was to change the world. He wanted to save the world on the whole. And he thought he could do that. And he knew he could do that with others' help. So I ask you, and I, it's a somewhat rhetorical question, was Bob stupid, as we laughed at, for driving two hours in the 30-degree heat with frozen waffles melting in his car to have them sent to a country where the famine ended 150 years beforehand? Yeah, yeah, he was. He, he was kind of stupid about that. But you know what? And this is why I love him, and this is why I add him into this talk. Because he was crazy enough to think he could change the world one little bit by one small act. Steve Jobs, one of his famous quotes, is people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that do. I think you guys are crazy enough to change the world. It might not be about food, it might not be about poverty, it might not be about charity in any way. But what I'm putting back to you guys just now is that we need to change something. We need to manage change. We need to drive change. All good things, good and bad, will end to make way for better things to happen. Because I believe the best is yet to come. Be that in a browser, be that in the next version of Joomla, be that in the next version of PHP or databases, be that in the next version of OSM, be that in the next version of our governments or poverty or whatever it is. I understand that the end of this is a little preachy, but you guys got into open source not for money, because you wanted to do something better. You guys wanted to change the way we published, change the way internet services work, change the way we work as a community and come together. You guys are my favorite, and this is going on YouTube, so this won't go well with the rest of my clients, but you guys are my favorite open source community because you have a non-profit at the top. You guys are working for the betterment of something. You guys are working to change the world, even if you don't know it just by being here. And I'm really proud to be here in front of you. And I want to say to you, let's change the world that little bit more. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.